So, in your opinion, who's the better basketball player? Team Wolf, Michael Jordan. <laughs> um, wow, uh, that's quite the comparison. We've got Michael J. Fox as Teen Wolf or Michael, what's his middle initial, Jordan? Uh, J? P. I don't Jordan? know. I don't know. Yeah, it's, no, it's Michael Jeffrey yeah, oh, Jordan. Michael Jeffrey yeah. Jordan. Uh, it's definitely Michael Jeffrey Jordan. Okay. Absolutely yeah. still better. Michael J. Jordan? I don't know. That wolf had some moves. No, he didn't. No, no. <laughs> the, the wolf could jump and dunk. But he had no handles. He didn't know how to play defense. Uh, well, hang on. He, he, didn't, he didn't need to play defense. Let me just stop you right there. When you're a wolf, you don't have to bother playing defense? Is that what you're saying? No, when you single-handedly score like 180 points a game. But the only reason he's scoring that many points is because he's stealing the ball from the others, right? Like That's, that's no way... defense. Stealing is defense. The, this uh, wolf and all of the basketball that was in this movie, Teen Wolf, was f***ing garbage. So you're saying it's kind of a 1A, 1B situation. No, no. Apples and oranges here in terms of <laughs> basketball skill. Um, Teen Wolf and Michael J. Fox are just absolute shit at basketball. Welcome to Bad Movies and Beer. I'm Cooper. And I'm Nolan. And uh, as you have clearly picked up on, we are talking about the 1985 comedy Teen Wolf starring Michael J. Fox as an unlikely basketball superstar slash werewolf. It's really something, as you pointed out, perhaps some dubious basketball skills, but we'll be going through all of that as we do. Before that, though, every week we pair the movie with some sort of craft beer, and what do we have this week? We've got the Lone Wolf Coffee Blonde this week, right? We've got Teen Wolf, we've got the Lone Wolf. It's from Sons of Kent Brewery. They're out of Chatham, Ontario. It's a really cool brewery and restaurant. They have a huge outdoor patio, and they have all kinds of events and live music. They have tons of different styles. They tend to lean, I think, almost slightly more traditional. The beer I recognize most is probably their, like, Berry White Raspberry Wheat. Great name. Great name for beer. Really, really good. Cool can. Cool picture. That one I have bought and drank before. It's quite delicious. So I'm looking forward to trying this one out. Absolutely. And a coffee blonde. I mean, I like coffee beers. I like blondes, obviously. So I'm optimistic about this one. Could be uh, two good weeks in a row for me here. Earth. Wait, what am I saying? Two good weeks? Like, Three, four. Yeah, you've been crushing it or getting lucky with your beer choices here. They've all been fitting in the non-IPA category, I guess. I'm sure there's more IPAs around the corner. I wouldn't worry too much about that. Or not. Who knows? But either way, let's just enjoy the ride. That's fair. I love beers in general. I'm interested in this one. I I wonder how they mix a blonde with a coffee, right? Most of the time, coffee are in much darker beers. Uh, So I'm excited to try this. I did do a little bit of reading, and it says they're only lightly roasted coffee beans. So I think this is still going to be a pretty light beer. Great. Well, why don't we get into it and we can see how it all goes down. Let's do it. So we open with vaguely spooky synth music and then like some kind of pulsing echo sound. And I was like, is this drums, thunder, giant footsteps? This all sounds super ominous, which will almost immediately not fit the tone of the rest of this movie. Yeah, I was a little confused, to be honest, when I heard that sound. I didn't know what it was going to open into. It took me a little while, and then when we transitioned to the shot of Michael J. Fox, I realized it's a heartbeat. Not a particularly good one, I might add. Uh, I didn't think it was super effective. But he's stressed out because he's got to take a big free throw. Yeah, we start with a little tension here. He's on the basketball court, staring down what seems like a very meaningful free throw. Now, I say seems meaningful because as soon as we see the score, we realize that his team is getting absolutely clowned by the other team. This free throw is not important even a little bit. Yeah, he's playing on the Beavers. I guess that's his school, and they're playing against the Dragons. The Dragons are up by like 45 points. I don't understand two things. One, why he's taking it so seriously, and two, why he's so sweaty. There's no way they can be down that much and he's put in enough effort to deserve that amount of sweat. Oh, see, I disagree. He strikes me as like a hustle first guy. Like no matter what the score is, he's out there working hard. We kind of see that a little bit later on. Like he's taking this very seriously, even when he gets knocked over and eats shit on the floor and a different guy tells him he sucks. We get the impression this kind of score is normal for the Beavers as the stands are sparsely populated by very bored looking fans. And their coach even suggests forfeiting the game so they can all beat the traffic. And as someone who's coached basketball and played basketball or even just watched basketball, I don't blame him. These guys are awful. (laughs) Shut it down. Unfortunately, the ref wouldn't let them end the game early. And the other coach wanted to be able to score as much so that they could get their records for points scored for the season. So they're not able to shut it down. 
This ball is brutal. I'm actually having trouble deciding whether it's club or school ball because all of the people playing in this game look like they're about 35. No, but we know that's standard for movies of this era. It's definitely the school team. It's the high school team. They're in the high school. The principal is there talking to the coach. It's not a traveling team or nothing like that. This is 100% school ball. It took me a minute to figure that out, though. It wasn't until the end of the game that I was able to, to decipher that just because of the age of the players. In particular, the guy they keep disparaging his weight over. That guy looks like he's very, very old. Oh, the fat center, who they just call Chubb? Yeah. Yeah, he, he, to be fair, he is the least high school-ish looking high school actor I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, he's clearly 45, maybe? I don't even know. Yeah, it's brutal, but it's hilarious. It is. Now, after the game, they're showering up, and we got our first hint that something is up with Michael J. Fox. He finds a couple of extremely long hairs coming out of his chest. Actually, that's our second hint. During the game, he got angry and let out a fairly animalistic growl. Now, he tries to talk to his coach about it. His exact words are... I'm going through changes. Oh, that. Don't worry about that. We all go through that. Some a little bit later than others. I'm sorry I didn't notice, but I haven't been hanging around the locker room all that much. No. What? Uh, I laughed my ass off. Like, obviously, this is a puberty conversation. Michael J is about to go through some of those changes in his life. He's about to become a man or, or a were-man, I guess, a werewolf. We're going to find out here shortly. The coach must walk around the locker room staring at c**ks. That's the only thing I can take from that. <laughs> yeah, just seeing how everything's developing. Hey, those are some new pubes. Yeah, I noticed you got a little more girth there this week. Uh, you're growing, <laughs> son. <laughs> He's so disturbing. The guy would get fired so fast. Anyway, Michael J. Fox wants to quit the team, but his coach pretty much won't let him. So the next day, he pours his heart out to his totally platonic friend, Boof, about how he hates being average and wants more than his simple life in this small town. What he really wants is Pamela Wells, the town hottie who we saw leaving the basketball game early after yawning in the stands. Now his friend, Boof, says he could do a lot better, but he has no idea what she's talking about. And he's late for work anyway, so see ya, Boof. He's so clueless. It's clear that his childhood friend, the girl that he's grown up with, them being so close, is falling for him in a romantic way at this point, but he can't see it. He's... He needs to have that town hottie, as you said, Pamela. Um, but she has no interest in him, and we're going to find that out very shortly. What a f***ing cliche this all is, eh? Like, the love right in front of his face the whole time. He has no idea. God damn. Yeah, it's true. It's put on pretty heavy here, right? The part of this movie that is maybe the worst is how lame the story is, right? Oh, definitely. And we get a little bit more of that soon. After a quick scene at his dad's hardware store where a kid blowing a dog whistle severely irritates Michael J. Fox's tender ears, we see him make a clumsy play for Pamela when he drops off some paint at a play rehearsal where Pamela is the lead. And by drops off, I mean he literally drops it when he notices his hands are a bit hairier than usual. So for the record, we're getting zero backstory on why he's becoming a werewolf. He's just becoming one. Yeah, we're just seeing him transition, weird things happening. We know because it's called Teen Wolf what's going on here. I thought you might like this scene because it was some classic, I'm carrying too much comedy. Oh, yeah. The, the comedy in this is not really great either. He's f***ing trying to carry too many things. He drops some stuff. Just like, ugh. And you know me, I love one trip. We talked about this in Dude Where's My Car last season, but like, it's not, it's not landing for me. I don't know what's happening here. Yeah, it's not done effectively. I mean, he is clearly a goofball who's struggling to bring all this hardware store stuff over. And then immediately after failing in the, like, hardware carry, he asks her out. And she has no interest in him, doesn't know who he is. Um, but luckily, we're about to get introduced to the uh, sort of, like, exciting, fun character of this story. You talking about Styles? <laughs> His friend Styles? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Uh, Scotty, that's Michael J. Fox's character, offers to drive him on this big party like you mentioned. We see our friend Styles unsuccessfully trying to buy beer in a separate scene for that same party. But Pamela's got her own ride, a tall, classically handsome type. So she sends Michael J. Fox packing. But he has a lot more luck than Styles did at that liquor store when he partially wolfs out on the guy behind the counter. After the old man criticizes these damn kids for being persistent, I guess, Michael J. Fox leans in and says, Give me a keg of beer. His eyes are glowing a demonic red, and it scares the store owner enough to give up the goods. Oh my goodness, yeah. There's a few things in here. One, the guy who picks up Pamela 
is the like lead basketball player from the Dragons from the start. The guy who told him he sucked at basketball and was in his face already. So he's already losing out both on the court and in real life to this guy. I think his name is Mick, maybe. Yeah, he might as well have a giant flashing sign above his head that says movie villain. It's just like locked in. He's that guy. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty rough. Um, And then Styles here is being a classic punk trying to order a keg of beer from a guy who... Asks for ID and he doesn't have it. The wolf move works though, and they're able to secure that keg of beer. And they think that they're heading into this party being heroes, bringing in a keg of beer. And what does it look like when they get there? Well, they find out that's not the case. But before that happens, let me ask you a question, Noel. You like van surfing? Oh my God. Is that, that's what we get next. Scotty Styles and some other friend of theirs are en route to the party, and Styles decides to climb out in the roof for some shenanigans. He almost wipes out when Michael J. Fox notices his ears looking particularly pointy in the side mirror and swerves, but they do arrive safely. Now, I have to say, if I were experiencing the kind of terrifying body changes Michael J. Fox is experiencing here on an increasingly frequent basis, not sure I'd be going to that party. Yeah, I'd be a little worried about what was happening to me, but, you know, he's got his eyes set on Pamela, and he cannot steer away from maybe still getting her, despite being rejected so heavily. The van surfing was pretty hilarious. The Styles character throws on that Hawaiian shirt and some sunglasses. Of course, the Beach Boys rock out as he heads up on top of there. Surfing USA. How much money do you think they spent to have that be a part of the movie? That was probably the thing that cost him the most money in this movie, I would assume. Like, more than any of the actors' salaries, getting the rights to surf in USA was probably number one. I think so. Other than Michael J. Fox's contract, possibly, I think that was the number two cost for this entire movie. Because it comes up twice in here, and it was pretty funny. So they get to the party, they bring the keg in, and they bring it to the kitchen, and there are already, like, six kegs in there. So it wasn't a big deal, which was kind of funny. I like that touch. And then all of a sudden, most of the entertainment at this party is being organized by the Styles character. He's got all these couples involved in some kind of, like, hilarious and kinky shit. Yeah, he's, for lack of a better term, almost like an MC, sort of, like, running the events of the evening. And many of those events are, like, oddly sexual party games. There's some kind of whipped cream worm thing. The fat guy from the basketball team has to eat a bunch of jello to some girl's shirt. And Boof maneuvers her way into the closet with Scotty for seven minutes of heaven. Yeah, so these longtime friends are now going to get a little bit close in this closet. And Boof's all in. She would like to get a little bit closer or more intimate with our Scotty character. And he doesn't want to be a bad friend or turn down this opportunity. So he kind of kisses her back as they, they start to get into it here. Oh, he really starts kissing her back in a second when his primal instincts kick in. And he even starts kind of getting a little rough with her. She slaps him in the face, and as she walks away, we see that he literally tore through the back of her shirt with his wolf claws. But she's not exactly complaining when they walk out of there, so, you know. Yeah, we might find out later that she's kind of into that. She doesn't mind him getting a little bit animal with her. This movie, is it really just about someone going through puberty? It's like a big metaphor, just a really clumsy metaphor, maybe. That's what it kind of feels like here, because it it just seems like we're about to have his, like, Cinderella moment. He's about to completely change and run out of that party, right? He's about to hit full puberty mode, but in here he's hitting pure werewolf mode. He is. Now, I mentioned a second ago, Boof not complaining. You know who is complaining right now? Me, about the extremely shitty effects we see when Michael J. Fox gets home and finally transforms into that werewolf. God damn. Damn, these are terrible. Yeah, I wondered how you'd feel about the werewolf costume. I didn't think you were going to be favorable. Um, It's awful. He looks more like one of the apes from Planet of the Apes than a f***ing werewolf. Yeah, it wasn't the best. I I don't know. I was kind of mixed on it. I felt like it was fine, but not good. It wasn't scary. It was almost like friendly. It kind of reminded me of Alf from the Alf show. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> he, he became more of like a friendly werewolf or like, I don't know. What was that Sasquatch show? I can't remember what that's Harry and the Hendersons. Yes. Or no, that was the fucking movie. Was that a show also? Yeah, it was a TV show too, I think. So it's pretty funny. It kind of felt like that to me. It was similar makeup to those kind of feelings. So he's had this change. His biggest thing he can say is, geez, Louise. We know it's a PG movie when that's sort of his response to turning into it. Um, His dad kind of hears some commotion. He hears him come home and he's on the other side of this bathroom door as he's going through these changes. This moment's kind of funny, right? Thinking about a father on the other side of the door as a son is experiencing puberty or some kind of major change. 
So he's kind of trying to get him to open up and talk to him about it, but Michael J is not having it. No, he's freaking out, but eventually his dad kind of wears him down and he agrees to open the bathroom door. And when he does, he sees that his dad is also a wolf. So this is genetic, I guess, which answers one question, but it also gave me another. If they had made this movie about his dad instead of him, would it have been better or worse than this? Wolf dad, <laughs> what do you think? I, I don't know. I mean, it depends on the kind of scenarios they put the children in. If the wolf dad was extremely embarrassing, this could have been a pretty funny movie. What if it's just him trying to, like, you know, run a successful hardware store? I'd watch a movie about a werewolf trying to <laughs> navigate the uncertain economy of 1985. No? Yeah, in there. Uh, we find out that his mom, I mean, his mom's not in the picture here, right? She's gone. But we find out that she was a werewolf, too. Um, this led me to have a bunch of questions. I was like, are there other female werewolves? Does he have to meet and be with a female werewolf only? Can you change people into werewolves? Do you start that way only? I, d I don't know. There's all kinds of questions here. Hang on. I don't think his mom was a werewolf. I think she was just a regular f***ing lady. Because the dad is the one who was worried about passing it on. He says it skips a generation. But she sounds like a normal girl. I'm and not he sure. he talks about her later on, like with the principal... I'm pretty sure they say that she's a werewolf, too. I'm pretty sure that at some point they comment that both of his parents were werewolf. I mean, Mick makes the comment about shooting her. I think that's the wolf reference. I don't think she was a werewolf. I don't know. It. I had questions about whether they, like... Like, it seemed like any time that Michael J. in this gets excited, he starts transforming into a werewolf. And I wondered if that happens when people get aroused. Like, I wondered if they were only able to have sex in werewolf <laughs> form. Like, yeah. if they were both wolves. And if it was only ever doggy style. Like, was that... <laughs> I couldn't uh, tell. But uh, good, I think that the question. whole family is wolves. Which which makes me wonder if Michael J. then needs to find a wolf to, to be with in the end. I'm not sure. There's all kinds of questions <laughs> I'm having here. I'm wondering if it's full moons only, too. Whether, like, if nope, we look at it's out not. Clearly not, because he has transformations other times. You can do it, kind of turn it on and off like yeah. a light switch. But that other question you asked, we are not going to get the answer in this extremely PG movie. That's not going to happen. <laughs> too bad, though. I would, nah, I'm wondering about that, too, actually. Yeah, now, now we have all kinds of questions. Yeah. What, did they make an adult version of this? Is there a No, but they made wolf? a sequel starring Jason Bateman where he's a boxer, not a basketball player. What? It's f***ing even worse than this. It's really bad. Same character? Uh, oh, I don't remember if it's the same character or not, but he is himself a teen wolf. Probably a different character. I hope so, because that'd be a weird transition. But all right, so he's turned into a wolf. He's not really comfortable talking to his dad about this, um, but he's got to go to school the next day. Yeah, now I mentioned him being able to turn it on and off like a light switch, but in a series of scenes at school the next day, we see that he cannot control this thing as he is freaking out in multiple classes. But Pamela Wells not only talks to him, she says there's something different about him in that way that implies that she might possibly someday let him touch a boob. <laughs> she notices that there's some changes going on in class. You know how there's sort of like, we can have a musk that we extrude. We don't necessarily smell it, but people <laughs> of the opposite sex can determine it. Just the, I mean, it's just his aura is different. This is a real, we've talked about this before. Like There's a thing, some people just put off a thing where you know, like yeah, that's that person, you know? It's like me with crazy women. Same thing. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just some sort of light goes off, just, right? Yeah, you don't, you know, it's there, and you get drawn to it. It's true. So he has this interaction, and that's kind of positive. Yet he gets called on by his teacher. Sorry, I think you just said he has this interaction. I actually heard <laughs> <laughs> he has this uh, wolf erection. <laughs> yeah, and it's positive. This whole section makes me think that it's all an innuendo for having an uncontrollable erection. His wolfishness is actually <laughs> just him getting boners that he can't control. That's the whole thing to me is a metaphor for that. I mean, that, that subtext fits, but either way, he is in a lot of trouble here. He needs to talk to someone. So in what is just an absolutely awful choice, if you're looking for someone sympathetic, considerate, capable of having a serious conversation, he decides to tell Styles. Styles here is wearing the famous "What are you looking at, Dick Nose" shirt, and as you might assume, is not super receptive to what Scotty is saying until he starts thinking about the ways they, specifically him, can use this to get money and attention. I mean, Styles is worried at first that he's going to tell him he's homosexual. Yes, we get some obligatory '80s homophobia in yeah, there. Yeah, some strong homophobia here, and then Michael J is very quick to tell him he's not gay, but that he's a werewolf. And this gets accepted way faster than if he were gay, right? Um, and then very quickly, he's like, I know what we can do here. You're TW. You are Teen Wolf. And he starts to market him immediately. He's already got a plan to make a bunch of cash and for them to both get popular based on him being able to turn into a wolf, which is just f***ing ridiculous. 
It is, but it's actually a smart move on Styles' part. The wheels start turning immediately. We see the other one. They do pretty well, so not a terrible idea. But in the meantime, when he returns home, Boof is at his house, and she's playing one-on-one basketball with his dad, which even in this movie, Michael J. Fox recognizes is weird as f***. Now, he briefly considers telling her what's going on when he walks her home. If you ever need someone to talk to, if something's bothering you, I'll understand. Uh, not this time, Boof. You won't understand. We learn that they've known each other forever, and there's clearly something happening there. But he doesn't. And at the next basketball game, we get a pretty good shot of him looking at her, and just beyond her, Pamela Wells. And again, this is just paint-by-numbers stuff right here. Yeah, it's pretty rough. That scene with Dad is weird, though, where Boof and Dad are having that one-on-one game. I don't know how many like female friends I had in high school that would go and ask my dad for advice. I know she's been around. For when years. you're not home, like, hey, want to play one on one? That'd be so strange. Neither of them could play basketball. Right? It, it was a strange thing. They're both out there like struggling horribly, and like, well, no one else in the movie can. Why should they be able to? It's true, but they may have been the worst performers that we saw in terms of handling and shooting a ball. Um. But it's a really strange thing. I don't know why she went to him. Uh, Maybe he was kind of like a father figure to her, but it felt uncomfortable. We do transition to this basketball game. They are playing, and of course they're struggling. But we see him go to the line again like he did at the very start of the movie. But this time when he goes to take the shot, we see his eyes turn red like you talked about before when he's kind of starting to wolf out a little bit. And what happens this time when he shoots? Well, this time it goes in, so they seem like they're doing a little bit better. But things really pick up when he dives in the floor for a ball, guys pile on top of him, and he bursts out of the pile as the Teen Wolf, which, in addition to stopping the room dead, immediately makes him infinitely better at basketball. He f***ing dunks from the free throw line, and now things get truly ridiculous. Yeah, this scene where he gets piled on for a jump ball, first of all, Every time a ball gets contested and two people are holding it in this movie, it takes them forever and they don't call a jump ball. Like, were there no jump balls at this point in time? Like, were there no jump balls in the 80s? I think it's just that the referees here are decorative, and I'll speak more to that in a second, but they don't do shit to police this basketball game. Yeah, I I was confused why it didn't get called, but then he gets piled on, and of course, because all this happened, he wolfs out. It does go quiet in the gym for a minute, and he kind of solo dribbles on his own baseline before like going down the court and dunking from the free throw line, like you said. But very quickly after doing that dunk, everyone loves him. Like his entire team, the whole court, uh, the referee, the other team obviously doesn't like getting beat by him, but nobody is angry or thrown off that someone transformed into a werewolf in front of them. Yeah, that's my biggest thing with this is like, how does no one f***ing react to this? Like, you'd think the referees would at least stop the game, get a clarification on whether werewolves are legal, something. (laughs) I love that you're thinking just in basketball terms, not in terms of, like, everyone being afraid that there's a f***ing werewolf. Dude, that too. Like, that also. Like, everyone's just kind of on board. They're all cheering. Even the guys he's playing against are just like, cool, we're playing a werewolf now. And he f***ing starts, like, tuning them. But this also f***ing killed me during this sequence. The cuts between basketball moves here, him dribbling, passing, dunking, they're just so clearly not the same movement, and this is just going to get worse as the movie goes along. This must be some of the worst recorded basketball in human history. It's <laughs> What about werewolf history? Both. Absolutely. Definitely <laughs> both. Um, yeah. uh, either when they're humans or when they are wolves, it literally is... I don't know, like seven-year-olds playing basketball. This is not a high school basketball game. The caliber of play that's happening here is so amateur, it's uncomfortable to watch. Yeah, half of them can't even f***ing dribble, and the shooting motion from a bunch of them is just awful. I did like how at one point, this is later in the movie, but when the fat guy goes to shoot the basketball, right as he's pushing it towards the net, a player runs in front of him, so you can't really see his release, but it was winding up to be awful. I can tell you that. Like, it's not good. No, it's really bad. The cool move that happens is, like, this very slow, deliberate, and, like, clearly telegraphed behind-the-back pass that would have never, like, been successful in any pickup game uh, ever. So it's pretty brutal. We have a montage here. I was going to say, you know what? You might not have enjoyed that basketball sequence, but I know you enjoyed the next part. Yeah, I love montages. We we know this. this is a bit of a thing for me. So we do get into a I'm a werewolf now montage as we see him transforming from 
like a loser teen into a winner werewolf. Oh, see, I call it the big man on campus montage, mm. which starts with a triumphant trip to the local diner where Pamela Wells slides into his booth and he shotguns a beer by punching a hole in it with his fangs. Then we get a bunch of shots of him strutting through the halls of the school and dominating more basketball games. He is just immediately feeling himself and everyone is on board with this complete 180 from Pamela here because I guess what woman wouldn't want to f a werewolf, right? Like that's a message that they tell us and I'm confused by it, right? He goes from being nothing and her hating him to him turning into a werewolf and being animalistic and doing all these dunks and winning all these basketball games. She even asks him to start performing in the play that she's in. I guess she's a theater person. That's where she's getting her clout on campus. And so he gets a small part in the play. And after rehearsing it with her, he ends up in her change room. Well, yeah, this play thing does not sit well with Boof, as you can imagine. She even makes a passive-aggressive comment about the advantages of being a werewolf. But as we see in that first play rehearsal, it turns out good acting is not one of them. But apparently what is one of them is howling when you climax. Yeah. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So he goes back to this change room and she says, don't worry. She's in her bra and panties when he goes back there. 80s bra and panties. Terrible bra and panties. The record can I throw it out there? Just awful. Awful. 80s. They're 80s. They're not good. No, but they're bad for the 80s. They were like weirdly like bunchy. It was terrible. Yeah. They they were not well fitted. Um, She takes off her bra and then she says, don't worry. We get closer in the change room. And then clearly, like, off-camera, f***s him. The only indication we get that they're actually having sex is we hear the howl when he c***s inside her. Which, we don't know what was inside her. Hang on a second. (laughs) I'm wondering how many pups they're going to create is really what what I'm curious about here. He must not have done a very good job. His pink crayon must not have satisfied because she does not seem interested to go back to that well later. That is true. We get kind of a date scene next with Scotty and Pamela at the bowling alley, and her ex is there, or so Scotty thinks, staring daggers at the two of them and even coming over to call him a freak and remind him that even though he's a werewolf, he's still a dork, which I agree with for the record. Scotty isn't sweating it, but that changes when Pamela makes it clear that she's still dating that guy and still planning on going to the spring dance with him. Michael J. Fox is like, what the f***? and decides to take it out in his next basketball opponent's. It's funny, right? Everything seemed really up for him. This montage was all about him becoming the big man on campus, like you said. But it seems like things with Pamela are not going so well. It seems like his basketball team is tired of him not passing the ball and taking over and doing everything on himself. It's And even his friends are starting to get a little tired of him. The only one who kind of is on board is Styles because he's making a lot of cash off him. Yeah, you're right. Some cracks are definitely starting to form in the foundation here. You did mention his basketball team, and although they are winning games, the rest of the guys are furious with him for hogging the glory, not involving them, and basically playing one on five. So essentially, he's become Kobe Bryant. (laughs) I mean, the others clearly aren't working hard enough to deserve a pass. As Kobe would say, you got to put in the time if you want me to pass you the ball. So I think that's what's happening here. He asks his coach for some advice on how to navigate this, and the coach is helpful as always. There's three rules that I live by. Never get less than 12 hours sleep. Never play cards with a guy who's got the same first name as a city. And never go near a lady who's got a tattoo of a dagger on her body. Now, you stick with that. Everything else is cream cheese. I mean, that is good (laughs) advice, but not really applicable here, you know? This coach character is actually one of my favorites in the movie because he's written as such a wild card. Like, nothing he talks about is connected. He's just such his, uh, his own free spirit here that it doesn't work in any way. So I love the advice he's giving here. It's weird that he walks around locker rooms checking out dongs, but I think that it's funny, <laughs> the, the the advice that he does give in this point. This, this coach is pretty hilarious. You know what? He's one of my favorite characters, too, but in this movie, that is a really, really low bar, so that's not really saying much. Now, Scotty decides to spend some time with friends to take his mind off all this. He goes for another van ride with Styles, but this time he's on top doing handstands and flips as they cruise the town. But their other friend, Lewis, doesn't want anything to do with him, and his father chastises him later for making a fool of himself and digging his own hole with his teammates. One person he didn't dig his own hole with, though, the principal of his school. This guy's been watching him very closely, and as his dad reveals, that's actually the dad's fault. This van ride where he is the one riding on top, this is like a four-minute part of the movie. I, I didn't understand why they gave so much time to him traveling around the town being a like an idiot on top. I guess Adding. 
padding. Yeah, it could be. And it's just showing how far he's gone uh, into his own self as like, I'm the best as the werewolf. It's pretty funny. This thing with the dad and the principal uh, is interesting too. The principal's given him a hard time before in this. In fact, he even went and found him in the bathroom a couple times which I think is kind of creepy, but it turns out dad and principal have a history. The principal wanted our main character's mom, right? They they had the same love interest here. And, uh, and what happened was there was a confrontation between um, our Teen Wolf's dad, right, and the principal, and the Teen Wolf's dad transformed into the wolf and made the principal piss his pants. That was kind of like one of the life things that happened. And since then, he's had it out for both his dad and now him as a member of his school. Yeah, and the lesson that dad's trying to pass along here is that Michael J. Fox needs to get a handle on his werewolf side fast before he does something terrible. Now, he makes a good first step the next day by asking Boof to the dance as he's clearly meant to be with her. She says yes, but on one condition, that he takes her, not the wolf. This launches him back into his I hate being average speech, and he says he can't do it. So one step forward, two steps back. Yeah, this is a struggle fest of a conversation, right? I I had trouble with this. You have been talking about and complaining about how much this is telegraphed through the movie, and I'm having trouble with this relationship. You know they're going to end up together, and she's the sort of voice of reason for him, and it's, it's annoying that he still feels like he has to be the wolf, even though he's making everyone else upset. We know that this dance is probably going to be the moment where he has to decide whether he wants to be Scott or the wolf. And so we're about to see that coming. So he gets dressed up in a fancy white suit and wolfs out as he heads into this dance. This is actually my favorite part of this whole movie. This quick scene where he's blow drying his hair while staying alive plays. I fucking love that. It's short, but I'm very enjoyable. But as you mentioned, from there, he struts into the dance while everyone chants, wolf, 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 wolf. And he grabs Boo for a dance set to a song called Big Bad Wolf that features not a small number of wolf-based dance moves. Lots of claw motions and growling here. Yeah, it seems very thriller-y to me um, as we see it happen. It's kind of like those zombie hand But like very low budget, like a homeless man's thriller, like yeah. not a real thriller. Oh yeah, but they're, they're making these wolf dances up so that uh, it goes with the song and he's in wolf form and... The whole crowd's kind of into it. Everyone except for Pamela and Mick, though. They're not quite down with this. Mick knows that Pamela's taken a ride on the pink crayon and isn't okay with that. He needs to get revenge. (laughs) That's true. Uh, And perhaps Boof knows that she's got to lock him in now while Pamela's there, so she pulls him away and makes her move. She wants Scott for at least half an hour. Is that how long it's going to take? That's the thought I had right there when she (laughs) says that. But when he walks back into the dance by himself, he gets absolutely walloped by Pamela's boyfriend. It seems like Michael J. might let this go, but once the guy calls Boof a little tramp, he comes up swinging, eyes glowing, and claws out. Yeah, he's about to transform. He's going to go after him as the werewolf. Mick kind of deserves it because he's a giant asshole and the villain of this movie, but... We just had that conversation with dad where he was like, you need to learn to control this. Otherwise, you're going to do something you regret. So we're kind of left with that moment. We're wondering whether Michael J. Fox is going to tear this Mick character apart or he's going to walk away and not regret this for the rest of his life. No, he just tears his shirt, but he has dug himself another hole here because now that he's basically assaulted someone on school property, the principal has got what he needed to kick him off the basketball team, if not out of the school which the principal gleefully tells him in the hallway. But then Scott's father, no doubt sensing something was amiss with his keen animal instincts, emerges from the shadows to tell the principal to back off. You uh, never learn, do you, Rusty? You stay away from me. I want you to leave my son alone. He's a good kid. He's just having a tough time right now. Okay? But seriously, why is he there? It makes no sense. No, it doesn't at all. I mean, I think he knew something was going to go down at this dance. The fact that he was there at the exact right time to step in for his son and have that conversation with the principal. He once again wolfs out and makes the principal piss himself. And then the principal goes back on the threat to sort of kick out Michael J. from the school. I mean, Mick started it and punched him first. He would have been having to kick them both out, but I'm 
don't think that Mick goes to the school. That's why he no, plays. No, he goes. He plays the Drake's different school. He's yeah. on the other high school team. Yeah. yeah, but that guy would certainly be arrested or expelled from his school if he started the fight. I guess I'm not sure, but maybe not. Yeah, it's tricky because it is the '80s, so you never know. Either way, Michael J. Fox decides he's putting away the wolf persona. He gets fired from the play for it and also decides to play the championship basketball game in human form, which is predictably not received well, at least not until he pumps up his teammates with a motivational speech and unleashes the awesome power of fundamental team basketball. (laughs) It's funny because we get the start of the basketball game without him. His team is starting off and getting beat, and again, they're playing the Dragons, right? This is the championship game. He's wolfed out all season to get them to the championship, and he won't wolf out here to win it for them. He shows up partway through the first quarter when they're losing pretty badly, and we get this pause in the gym. It takes more time for this team to accept him back than it did for everyone to accept him when he wolfed out, which was hilarious. That's a great point by you. And yeah, it's a real good message in here about being yourself, but it's not earned. They don't earn this message. No, they don't at all. I agree. Yeah. Regardless, he's in the game now and they're like the 2014 Spurs here. They're cutting, passing, creating good shots, or at least what the 8,000 cuts try to make it look like. And somehow they managed to close a nearly 30 point gap and get Michael J. Fox to the foul line with the game on the line. Now I should note that the song that's playing during this game is called win in the end. And it's fucking insane. One line in the song said the guy was going to change the pattern, steal a ring from Saturn, forge myself into a man of war. What does that even f***ing mean? I was going to say, it's with the help of this new wave song and and a montage that gets them back in the game. It's f***ing fantastic. I am loving this song, despite it being the most ridiculous shit in the history of, like, 80s music. Like, I know it has the word win in it, but the lyrics in no way, shape, or form relate to f***ing basketball or anything relevant to what's happening here. Hey, Saturn is a sphere. A basketball's a sphere. We've got it. We're together. <laughs> the Man of War is one of nature's uh, greatest f***ing fighters. I don't know. Like, what is this? I mean, it lives in the ocean. It's wet like these sweaty men who are trying to win a basketball game. It's all connected to me. Well, you've convinced me again. This is You've really done it here. This is a great job. No, you'll uh, you'll never believe it. But he makes both shots to win the game and gets carried away on the shoulders of the fans. When he jumps down, he basically pushes Pamela out of the way and goes right to Boof. They share a passionate kiss before he jumps into the arms of his dad. Everyone's celebrating. And then, freeze frame! (laughs) Or not, as they unfreeze when the credits start rolling. We get them all jumping around again in slow motion. What an odd f***ing choice this was. I want to go back to the end of the game there. So, he gets fouled at the end of the game by Mick, the like guy who was his enemy the entire time. And on this foul, Mick fouls out. They'd made a point of telling us how many fouls he had in the game, and this was his final foul. What does he do when Michael Jay's, like, at the line ready to take his shots? I actually don't remember. What does he do? He's standing under the basket, staring him down the entire time he takes it. If you get your fifth foul and you get removed from a game, you foul out, are you allowed to stand under the basket to stare down the person who is taking the shots? I, okay, I, I get what you're saying, but I mean, at worst, that's like the fifth least realistic thing about these basketball scenes, so come on. I don't know. It, it drove me crazy. I was like, I know they're trying to build tension here because this is a standoff between the two, but there's no way he should have been there. Like, nobody else was out there. There wasn't even people, like, surrounding the paint. Those people weren't there. It was just, like, mano a mano on these free throws. He hits them all. He gets carried off. He gets to go, like, make out with Booth, and then his dad shows up again making another creepy moment. Um, I wondered if you would count this as a freeze frame. I thought it was strange that they froze it and then opened it up again. I hadn't seen that as an ending. No, I've never seen that before. It's a, Again, it's a really f***ing weird choice, and I don't know what the point of it was. Is it a point half? Like, do you give it a, a half bonus? Is it a point one? Does it get I'm not negative? giving it nothing. This was a, it was a, if anything, it was a tease. Ooh, it's they, negative. They gave it to me and took it away. I don't like it. Oh, shit. So it's going to be a negative here. Okay. It's good to know. So we're out now. The movie's over, and we got to decide. So we're going right to the ratings, eh? Okay, let's do it. All my questions have to do with wolves and wolves having sex and whether she turns into a wolf, so I don't know if we want to go there. <laughs> no, that's fine. Let's just go to our ratings. The way we do this, we rate the movie on a scale of 1 to 10 two times. 1 to 10 for how bad it is, 1 to 10 for how enjoyable, and the goal is to find movies that are a 10 out of 10 on both scales, or what we call the... Crit 20. 20, 20, 20, 20. And I will say, for me, it's going to be in play because I think this movie is 10 out of 10 bad. Just f- absurd in terms of so many parts the plot the scenes of basketball 
The acting's pretty bad in a lot of cases. The wolf effects are fucking terrible. The fact that no one reacts to this or finds it weird. Like, this whole thing is just absurd on so many levels. And there was not nearly enough comedy or enjoyable parts in it for a movie that's supposed to be a comedy to make me overlook the many, many absurd choices that went into this thing. So I have this as a 10 bad. And if you have it lower than a 10 bad, I'll be both surprised and furious. What do you think? Get ready to get mad. Are you serious? I had this as a 7 bad. Jesus H. Christ. Well, we were talking about last week. We haven't had a lot of disagreements lately. This is going to be one for sure. <laughs> How can you possibly justify this piece of shit being a 7, not a 10? So I have a theory about why you hate this so much. And my theory is because the basketball scenes are absolutely trash. Yeah, and the movie is based on him being good at basketball when he's a fucking werewolf. But it's absurd. And you're a person who takes basketball seriously. You've been playing and coaching it your entire life. And so I understand that... This movie is offensive to you because of that. And and I feel that. I do think it was cheesy. I think the basketball scene sucked ass. Um, I thought that the reaction to him turning into a werewolf and him instantly becoming like a school hero was absolutely bullshit. Like all of those things bothered me a lot. But I felt like the like actors were fine. The story, although paint by numbers was what it was supposed to be. I thought it wasn't that bad. I thought the music helped pull it through. I thought it, it moved pretty quickly. I only had it as a seven bad. The music was low-key terrible. We've had some movies the great 80s soundtracks this season. These songs were, like, slightly off. There was something weird about all of them. Also, you mentioned the cliches and how everything is so f***ing paint by numbers. Like, it is so much that it just highlights how shitty this movie is compared to other movies that also do that. That's my biggest problem. It's like we've seen every one of these fucking tropes. We've seen other movies do it better. I can't believe you have it as seven. I'm almost scared to ask how much you enjoyed it because I'm thinking it's going to be a fucking high number and I'm going to lose my shit on you. This movie I laughed at a lot. I thought the Styles character was ridiculous but funny. Um, he's I, the one, I will say, he's the one guy that does a pretty good job in this as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Everyone else I think sucked. Although I did like Boof also. Yeah, there you go. Despite what you said about the music, I enjoyed it. I thought it was really breezy. I did not feel like it was dragging. I felt like it moved pretty quickly. They had a lot of montages in here. <laughs> like a lot it, of the right? movie was put yeah. through in montages. You know how that feels for me. So all of that together, I had this as an eight enjoyable. Jesus Christ, man. Ugh, this is insane to me. I have it as a six enjoyable because, again, the complete absence of logic in the reaction to him when he becomes a wolf the sheer level of awfulness of these basketball scenes. They also used a lot of the same shots for some of those scenes. Like it was clearly uh, the exact same footage of that one guy blocking that one shot. He blocks it in the exact same way in the exact same direction. They're just recycling footage here. Also, uh, Michael J. Fox, whether he's the wolf or human, can't fucking shoot a basketball at all. Same with most of the other actors. Like, it's so bad and such an important part of this movie. I can't possibly take this seriously. There was not enough comedy in there. Styles is charming, like, in his own weird f***ing way. But, like, not enough for me to put this anywhere close to, like, an 8. I don't know how you f***ing went with this. You watched with your kids or something? Were they like, yay, a werewolf? Like, what on earth? No, I watched this I watched this without my kids. I watched it alone and, and enjoyed it. I, I really think that the basketball, the... Like And I will admit, the basketball is the worst basketball I have ever seen on film. Yeah, you said worst ever on screen, and I, you're giving I agree it a eight for enjoyable. I agree. It's so bad. But I feel like that doesn't affect it enough for me to not enjoy it. And I think I laughed at how horrible it was. You were offended by how brutal the basketball was, and I think that stuck out to you, and it affected your enjoyability and your bad rating. Well, goddamn, there must have been actors in the 80s they could have got who could fucking dribble a basketball or shoot like they never play a sport in their fucking life, you know? I mean, half the people on the team don't even have lines. They could have at least got basketball players to play those roles. That would have been great. Because clearly it was all actors and none of them with basketball skill. Yeah. Like, there's zero, there's negative skill in this movie. Yeah. No, I agree with that. But I don't think that took away from the enjoyment for me. I felt like it was it was speedy enough. I felt like we got enough of a mix of, like, teen sexuality and confusion and drama the relationship between his dad and him was a little weird. That's the one that probably throws me off. I wish that wasn't quite so creepy. Um, that would help me move towards a, a higher rating. I think if the basketball were better, I would have given it higher rating as well. But I'd still stick in with my, my eight overall for enjoyability. 
I don't know that I'll watch it again, uh, as as so often with many of the movies we watch, but I, I don't regret watching this one. Well, I do regret watching it again. I've seen it before. I will not watch it again. What a piece of shit this movie is. You wanted a disagreement <laughs> last week. We've got one this week. We did not disagree about Truck Turner or Streets of Fire, really. This is a big f***ing disagreement. I think this movie is hot garbage, and I don't know how you're sitting here f***ing not giving it a 10 for bad and also giving it an 8 for enjoyable. That, to me, is insane. I'm looking forward to all the people defending me and defending this movie and coming after you. Uh, I even contemplated giving it a four or a five for bad just so that we could oh have a complete God in like, heaven. This, this shouldn't have been on our podcast. I, I couldn't based on the basketball. That's and, right. Yeah, I was going to say. And the reaction to him being a werewolf because that was just like absolutely mind blowing. I couldn't understand why everyone acted that way. But the like... The enjoyability is there. The The amount that you have to question wolf sexuality adds to it too, right? It just has to happen in there. So you can't you can't not enjoy this as an experience. It makes you think. <laughs> I mean, I will admit, I probably would have enjoyed this more had I been thinking about wolf boners as much as you were. That, you know, added, I probably enjoyed us talking about it more than the actual fucking movie, which wouldn't be hard because I did not enjoy the movie. But God damn, man, that's just insane to me. All right, so we are miles apart on this one. Which happens every so often. If you're a big Teen Wolf fan, you want to support Nolan, fucking go ahead and let him know. Uh, are we going to be miles apart on this beer? That's the question. I don't think so. I don't think we will be at all. This Lone Wolf Coffee Blonde. Um, it was easy to drink, but it had a depth of flavor that wasn't uh, your traditional blonde. It was, wasn't as crushable as our beer from last week, right? That beer from last week was one you could just go like chug down and drink a whole bunch more. This one I'd probably only want to have one or two in a session kind of thing, but I like the bitterness that was added to it from that light coffee flavor. And it was different than the coffee flavor you get in a stout for me. It wasn't quite as dark, quite as chocolatey. It was a much more like subtle bitterness. I agree. It was You get a lot more just like straight coffee flavor as opposed to those kind of chocolatey notes. And I was surprised because it is a very light beer. Like when you pour it, it looks light. So I was like, this is going to have fucking zero coffee flavor. But no, they actually managed to infuse a decent amount of coffee flavor without having it like a dark appearance. So whatever they're doing over there, like it works. It was very tasty. I agree. Probably just like one or two in a night or whatever. But uh, I enjoyed this and I would definitely get it again. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely recommend it. And I think you should go check out some beers from Sons of Kent. They have a lot of really cool offerings there. I've drank a lot of their stuff. We have a... Uh, a friend of the show, uh, Brian, from that area has hooked us up with a bunch of really delicious beer, and I think you should check those out. Speaking of friends of the show, next week we are going to be joined for the first time ever by not only a friend, but also the producer of Bad Movies and Beer. Producer John is going to sit down with us while we talk about a movie based on a video game very near and dear to his heart. Next week we're going to be talking Super Mario Brothers the Movie. <laughs> Oh, I am so stoked. I love Producer John, great human, and I love video games, in particular the Super Mario series. So this is going to be a treat. I have never seen this movie. I just couldn't bring myself to watch it because I'd heard some negative stuff. So Yeah, you might want to pump the brakes on this being a treat because that movie is truly awful. But we'll see what you and Producer John have to think about next week. Before then, if you have not already, please follow us on social media at the BMB Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Feel free to send us any suggestions for beer and or movies or to send us any feedback. Tell Cooper how wrong he is and how much you love Teen Wolf. Absolutely. We always love hearing from you and we hope you'll join us next week. Until then, I'm Cooper. And I'm Nolan. And we'll see you next time on Bad Movies and Beer. Keep it howling. He's a wolf in teen's clothing. And tonight is his night to howl.